So the reason we build active speakers is quite a lot to do with what's wrong with conventional speakers, which is what we call you would call a passive speaker. So as you know, the, the vast majority of the architecture, of system architecture, uses a power amplifier from somebody and a loudspeaker, and inside the loudspeakers is passive crossover. And it's a very, very primitive method of reproducing sound. Um, the passive crossover itself, because it's high level, introduces distortion, introduces storage. It's very difficult to get a good crossover design that's easy to drive. It doesn't provide damping for the loudspeakers. I mean, when, when you have a passive crossover and you have a frequency region where, where the amplifier is not connected to the drive unit, the drive unit is free to, to vibrate on its own. And that introduces coloration. So there's a lot of reasons why the passive crossover is, is a very poor use of, um, a very poor approach to building a speaker. It's also a very inefficient way of using an amplifier because when you, when you have an amplifier and it has to do low frequencies and mid frequencies and high frequencies, um, you end up with the total power of the amplifier being spread across each of the frequency regions. Um, because of that, the amplifier has to be designed because you, you don't know what the light speaker is. Somebody will design a speaker with a strange impedance curve and we don't know what the music's going to be played through it. So you end up with an amplifier which is very, very over-engineered for the, for the requirement. Um, you know, a conventional power amplifier has got a lot more heat sink and a lot more power supply than is necessary actually to make the music if you design the speaker properly. So we build the active speakers and what we mean by active is that there is one amplifier for each frequency range in the speaker. So it's not a powered speaker. In the pro area you would have a powered speaker which is like a conventional speaker with a power amplifier screwed on the back. But an active speaker has an electronic or a digital crossover. And we've built these speakers like that so that, for example, in our very first speaker, the M1, there was three frequency ranges, three power amplifiers, an electronic crossover. And the advantage of the electronic crossover, the active crossover, is that it's low distortion. You can make a much more accurate filter with low-level electronics than you can with power, inductors and capacitors. It lasts longer. It's, uh, you can introduce things like time dispersion correction, which you can't do in a passive crossover. So you can end up with a much more accurate result. But in addition, every drive unit's got its own power amplifier. The tweeter has a power amplifier directly connected to it. And that amplifier controls the tweeter throughout the whole of the frequency range. Same with the mid-range, same with the bass. And the amplifier can be designed for that purpose. And yes, you can you can use a smaller set of amplifiers, or if you take the Meridian approach, you can still fit g good, powerful amplifiers and end up with a speaker which has enormous dynamics and can play very loud for the, uh, you know, for the, for the, play very loud for the power that's included in it. If you take something like the 5200 you heard downstairs, it's capable of extraordinary precision and loud loudness that in a passive speaker you need many hundreds of watts to achieve and it doesn't it doesn't need that kind of power because the power is in fact more effectively applied so that gives us um, the ability to make a speaker which which is loud and also clean because one of the one of the most interesting attributes of an active loudspeaker you know if you like the first audible attribute is that it plays very well when it's quiet and when it's loud and it sounds the same at all levels. And if you listen to most passive speakers and power amplifier combinations, you'll find that it's been tuned by the designer at some volume level and then if it goes loud, it sounds like a different speaker and if you play it soft, it sounds like a different speaker. But, but an active speaker, from the highest dynamic to the quietest, will sound, you know, if it's built like ours, like the same speaker, and therefore the instrument, as the sound decays or as it's further away, sounds more natural. And another attribute of an active speaker 
is that it has the ability to resolve small details in the presence of loud details. For example, the mid-range can be doing something quite delicate while the bass is doing something quite energetic. That doesn't work well in an ordinary speaker. And so these are the reasons that we build the speakers with amplifiers built in, and always have. Um, now, in the, in the late 80s, we introduced first a digital speaker, which is like an active speaker with a D2A converter built into it. But very soon after that, in 1991, we introduced a full DSP speaker. And the reason for that is, is just more layers of getting higher quality. If we take the digital signals into the speaker, first of all, we can make a crossover that's even more precise because we can do things in DSP that are too complicated or impossible to do in an active crossover. So just like an active crossover is better than a passive one, a digital one can do more things that an active can do. And with digital, we can also do things like pure time delay, so we can correct for the position of the speakers and we can steer the beam of the speaker. Right? And the DSP also gives us the ability to do fine correction that's more difficult to do in an analog circuit. See, the thing about analog processing, as you all know, is the more of it you have, every, every additional analog stage you add, adds some degree of degradation to the audio. Because, you know, if you have a preamplifier, an equalizer, and so on, if you add a box, the sound deteriorates. If you add a stage to an amplifier, the sound in some way deteriorates. With digital processing, if you do it right, with lots of precision, you can have lots of stages and it doesn't, it doesn't add degradation because the only degrading step in digital processing is at the end when you'd finally come from 48 or 72 bits to 24. And um, so it, in the digital crossover, we can, on the DSP speaker, we can add other things like tone controls, like steering, like uh, equalization, but also things that help the speaker be a better speaker, like dynamic bass control. Uh, you're probably not aware of it, but, but, or you may have, maybe you were taught in training, but the, our speakers like the DSP-8000 are capable of enormous bass output. But with the smaller speakers like 3100 perhaps, or even 5200, they have uh, DSP running where the, the DSP engine is actually working out all the time where the cone of the speaker is. And if it decides that, that the music's going to push it too far, rather than make a nasty noise, it will, it will dynamically adjust the response of the speaker. So you play something like a 3100 really loud. Um, the louder you play it, the smaller it becomes as a loudspeaker, or rather when it's, when it's played quietly, it's a very much bigger speaker than it is. So the DSP is able to do that sort of correction, which is very effective. And also, um, it continuously works out the temperature of the voice coils. So we're able to make compensation for that and also to make sure that you don't damage the speaker. So one of the nice things about an active speaker is that the way we design them, the design is a total system and they're very, very, very reliable. The power amplifier is perfectly matched. The dealer can't get the cables in the wrong place um, because the amplifier is, is permanently connected to the loudspeaker and it's designed for that load. It tends to have a long lifetime. And the same is true of the digital ones. And another advantage of a digital speaker, of course, is that we take the signal digitally all the way to the speaker. So instead, you know, whereas with an active speaker, we still need to have an analog connection, and that has bigger problems than the jitter of a digital connection, because um, you have all, all the issues of which cable you're going to use. Or we bypass all those cable questions by, by feeding the signal digitally um, into it, and then having one stage of conversion. So you know, everything that we do in the way we build the speakers is the pursuit of quality. And for, for Meridian, quality means the sound of real instruments and real music in real space reproduced naturally and with all the dynamics of the natural thing. And the dynamics are huge. We were often amused by some of the claims that are made for small loudspeakers, especially, you know, for iPod docks, where you have a one-inch driver and it says fills the room with natural sound. But we we know 
that the most challenging thing you can ask any loudspeaker to do is to reproduce one single piano. You know, it takes enormous acoustic output to do that. And so something like 8,000 will do that. Uh, 5200 will just about do that. Um, but to get that kind of sound requires... The, the active and the digital helps a lot with the signals. And there's, there's another level then, which is the mechanical part of the speaker, which is just as important. The speaker must be low coloration, rigid. If you've got 24 bits of resolution going in, you need you know, at least 16 bits of resolution from the cabinet. Most company speakers, you measure them, they have about 6 bits of resolution because there's so much extra sound coming off the walls of the loudspeaker. Right? Really, the only sounds we want to hear are the sounds that come out of the, the drive units themselves. And that's why if you look at these, these speakers, 8,000, 7,000, 5,200, they're very rigid, these curved panels and so on. So the sound is, from the speakers, very clear.